to the Leadership and Success Podcast with your host, Coach BZ. If you need to develop into a better leader, this podcast is for you. If you want to achieve a greater level of success, this podcast is for you. His mentor, Dr. John C. Maxwell, said it best, everything rises and falls on leadership. We hope to inspire you today and provide you with an insight that has the potential to positively impact the trajectory of your life. Welcome to the Leadership and Success Podcast. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, very, very glad to be with you again. And today, uh, my guest, uh, I'm very, very privileged to have uh, Ian Patterson. He's uh, the uh, CEO of uh, Plurilac uh, in uh, Vancouver, uh, Canada. How are you doing, uh, Ian? I'm doing well. It's been uh, it's it's been a, a wet last few days. We've had a lot of rain here in in British Columbia and Vancouver, but I, I'm doing I'm dry and well today. So I'm thankful for that. Good good to know. Uh, thank you thank you so much for for your time. We really uh, value that. So again, we have about thirty six thousand people or so who uh, watch uh, this uh, show this. Um, Podcast is all about leadership and success. They, they want to be a better leader and they want to achieve greater level of success. Can you tell us a little bit about your uh, leadership journey? Well, my background, I've, I've always been an operator of businesses. Uh, even, even before I officially entered the workforce, uh, I was one of those kids who uh, in, uh, I think, second or third grade, I, I would uh, create a little business. I would make business cards for people. So I had a, an old laser printer. And uh, for those who remember, you can you may still be able to buy the, per, the perforated business cards. And so I would go through and, and I would try and uh, create great designs for, uh, for, for anyone I thought could, could use a business. Of course, uh, my colleagues uh, in the first and second grades were not um, great users of business cards, but uh, there were a bunch of adults around me who, who uh, wanted to support me, I guess. Anyway, so, um, so I think I started from, from a young age building businesses, but then also uh, trying to scale them with people. And so really being enthusiastic and, and trying to bring people with me along the journey. Um, and so again, with the, with the business card business, um, uh, I would try and enlist other people as, as affiliates to go and, and find customers. Um, and so it's that, and that's, and that's really been the, 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 the trend I would say over the last 10 years, um, I really focused on, on building value by using data. So data and analytics, I think in, you know, the old days we used to call it big data. Um, but trying to solve problems for companies using data first in the e-commerce industry. Um, and then now more in the in the cybersecurity industry. Wow, that is quite uh, fascinating. Looks like you are quite a serial entrepreneur, uh, being CEO and founder of so so many uh, companies. Actually, there is a lady in my mastermind group who just uh, trying to launch a, a business, and one of the challenges now is kind of raising uh, capital. Uh, do you have any suggestion tips, or how did that work for you with all of your businesses? I think raising capital is, is really specific to the business that you're in. I, I've, I've been fortunate. So I've, I've had three, um, three career stops over the last dozen years or so, but in very different um, capital environments. So I was, uh, I held the position of director of insights for an e-commerce analytics company that was venture backed. And so I got to get a, a really close look at what it meant to raise true venture capital from institutional investors. Um, that company was eventually acquired by eBay. Um, my, my, the, the company I founded after that uh, was called Exapic, and there we bootstrapped. I mean, my, my funding, if you call it that, was a, a $10,000 Visa credit card that I racked up uh, in, in the first part of the business, and then that was, that was the funding. So, so that was a very different environment. Um, I can remember the very first uh, server that I, um, that I used to, to build the infrastructure. So Exapic, just by way of background, uh, it was a, is a data and analytics platform. And at its peak, we were processing billions of data points per month. And I, I can remember everything was on a shoestring. And so I remember, uh, I, I found a server for $2 and 33 cents per month, but I had to pay, uh, on a three month basis. It wasn't a monthly plan. It wasn't an annual plan. It was a quarterly plan. Anyway, that was the cheapest infrastructure just to get going. Right, so very different operating environment than than venture capital, 
And then Plurlock, which is which is where I am now, um, we started private. Uh, I, I raised uh, several million dollars of of angel funding, so it was still external capital, but it wasn't institutional, not not like a true venture capital model. Um, and then last year, just over a year ago, uh, I, I took Plurlock public, and so now we have access to the public markets. And so very very different environments. And I think what I would say to your colleague is that the, the choice of capital really depends on what you're trying to do and trying to achieve. And I think that, yeah. that there are certain types of capital that really make a lot of sense for some businesses and really don't make sense. Perfect example, if I had tra tried to raise venture capital for my business card business when I was in first and second grade, um, you know, it does, it, that's not a venture scale business. It doesn't, it doesn't match, I don't think, it doesn't match the, uh, the, financial outcome of what a venture capitalist needs to see. And so it wouldn't be, you'd, you'd have a very hard time raising that capital. Um, <clears throat> you know, conversely, Plurlock, we're in the cybersecurity uh, industry and there, there's an estimate floating around that the cybersecurity market overall is, is estimated to be over a trillion dollars of spending over a five year cumulative period. So, um, so there you actually could uh, make the argument that, yeah, you should raise venture capital if you're in cybersecurity. So I really think it, it, it comes down to the context of what you're trying to do, and then that will inform what choice makes sense. Yeah, that is that is uh, very, very well said. And uh, another thing, right, you are a founder, CEO, and you've done it several times. So you have a product, a uh, service, a solution for the market, but then you have to build a team, you have to build an, or an organization, right? Build a profitable company. So as a leader, uh, how has it been for you dealing with people? I guess you need people in order to do what you need to do, but then sometimes you feel like, you know, you can live without them, but then you can't really live with them. Uh, sometimes I, I wonder if how some uh, married couple feels, but anyway, uh, what, what about the human element of leadership? I, I think that people are crucial. I mean, there's there's the old saying, right? If you want to go somewhere fast, you go alone. If you want to go somewhere far, you go together. And I think that that really applies a lot in business. Uh, you know, I think that there, there, there's a lot that we could talk about around leadership. But what I have always tried to do is um, is twofold. First is ask for help, um, because a lot of the times with leadership, you know, some people have the expectation that leadership is around giving orders and telling people what to do. My preference is always to ask for help. Um, genuinely, look, can you help me with this problem? Um, and then that way you're working collaboratively together to get to somewhere else. I think the second, the second part around leadership is I'm always looking for people who are smarter, better, more experienced, uh, funnier, better looking than I am. Uh, because if I can surround myself with these people who are just so much better on, on every dimension, um, we are collectively going to have a much better likelihood of success than if I was only looking for, um, you know, people that I could, uh, I, I could talk down to. And so I think that um, that require, both of those two things require humility. And so humility, if you can, if you can stay humble, if you can accept that there are things that you don't know that you need help from other people, I actually think that that's one of the secrets to leadership. And, and certainly that's, that's been a, a huge part of, of the success that I have had. Uh, is around staying humble and, and asking from help, asking for help from smarter people. No, this is this is uh, quite uh, true, and I think one of the secrets of uh, success in general is to find people who can complement you, right? Uh, who are not the same as as you, who can look at your blind spot, and together you can accomplish so much more than you can by yourself. How do you think does uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion kind of fit into that? Well, I think that the the early success that Plurlock had was as a result of our diversity. I mean, Plurlock. So, so I'll, I'll just give you a, a little bit of context. But Plurlock is a cybersecurity solution around authenticating people, and we're able to authenticate people based on their behavior. So, quite literally, the way that you type on a keyboard, the way that you move a mouse, this can identify a human uh, rapidly and continuously. And we were only really able to get this solution off the ground because we had a, a, a multinational team um, first at the, on the research side and then on the development side. And so the, the, the early days of Plurilock, we had people from Africa, from Europe, from North America, uh, from, from South America as well, actually, now that I think about it. Um, and then we'd grown from that. And so um, in, in the very early days, we, one of the, the team building um, items that we did is we would have everybody put a poster up on the wall 
uh, of the city that they associated with. Maybe they were born there, but maybe they, you know, maybe they were born somewhere else. Maybe they grew up there and they, they really felt they had an affinity to a certain city. And so you walk around the office and you would see uh, you'd see all of these different cities from around the world. You'd see Morocco, you would see Paris, you would see Sao Paulo in Brazil, you would see Vancouver, you would see uh, um, Belgium, you uh, Brussels in Belgium. And so, so you had a feeling, you had a visual representation of how diverse the, the team was. And I think that that was really what was enabling us to be successful because we had the ability to look at problems from so many different views both from so many different educational backgrounds, but also from so many different cultural backgrounds, from so many different languages. And so it really provided a much more fulsome approach to thinking about problems, which, um, you know, it's impossible to, to, to run an experiment to know was how crucial that was, but I really feel was, um, was critical in, to, to our early success. Wow, that is uh, quite uh, fascinating. And talking about uh, leading a diverse team, is there anything you, you think you've done to kind of ensure the uh, professional and leadership development of your direct uh, report? It's a good question. I always worry that we're not doing enough. Um, you know, I think I, I remember hearing a, a podcast by Jamie Dimond, uh, uh, you know, very, very large financial services executive. And he, he said one of his worries, the thing that he always um, laid awake uh, wondering about was whether he he had enough time thinking about strategy versus the, just the actual everyday decision making. And I think the same thing is true for us around, are we spending enough time working on the business or on the people as opposed to in the business? Um, so, so I don't know. I, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure that, um, that we've nailed the balance. I think that there's there's definitely more to do. Um, and I think it's also harder now because we're all remote. Um, Pluralock as a company, we've always been remote first, but now we're just fully remote. And so now even you know some of the smaller moments or rituals that we had around getting together in the office, um, you know, no longer exist. And so it's it's something that I'm uh, it's something that's on my mind and, and is 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 a focus of ours uh, moving forward. Yes, uh, that's definitely true for almost all of the uh, companies around the world now because of this um, pandemic. And how do you really maintain or build a culture when 100% uh, of your staff is 100% remote? I'm sure that's quite challenging. I anything you've learned in the past year? About that? I, I, I don't. I don't think that we have any secret weapon. I think. I, I think it's just being very intentional about creating moments around. Um, sharing insight and sharing information and trying to create an environment where you build time for the things that don't appear absolutely necessary, but actually turn out to be crucial. Um, you know, just creating, creating those moments where you can all jump on a, I hate to say it, but jump on a Zoom call and just chat, you know, or, yes. or, or actually allocating the first five minutes of a meeting uh, to, to just connecting with individuals before you get into the day to day. Um, you know, those are those are some of the things that we've uh, that, that that we've been doing. I think we've also, um, you know, because we're uh, we started as a as a uh, deep tech a deep tech cybersecurity company. You know, we were we always had a, a pretty good handle on asynchronous communication using Slack and and, and messaging and so forth. And so really leaning into that um, with um, with with ways of engaging people. Um, but but we're still sorting through it. You know, we're we're still thinking through it. I think the way the same way that other people are, and and we're we're earnestly looking for other best practices that we can bring in and implement as well. This is uh, so insightful. I know uh, this week uh, our CEO during our all hands meeting took about 10, 15 minutes to just allow everybody uh, to say what they were thankful for. That was a very very uh, touching moment. Uh, it almost made me made me cry just to kind of see what everybody else is going through but what they are thankful for and, and uh, hoping for. I felt like it kind of brought us closer uh, together. Now, changing the page now, you and I, we are both uh, members of the exclusive uh, Forbes Technology uh, Council. That's, that is how we, uh, we met. Can you tell us a little bit about your journey there, how it happened uh, for you, how you got invited? Well, 
so again, the, the, the context here is that Plurlock, we're in the cybersecurity industry, like, like we were talking about, cybersecurity is estimated to be massive by, you know, by any, any way you want to slice it, by spending, by market share, et cetera. Um, but uh, a lot of other people know that as well. And so there's, there's a huge amount of players in the cybersecurity ecosystem that it's sometimes difficult to be able to differentiate uh, one company from the next. Um, so we were very fortunate to, uh, to have the opportunity to join uh, the Forbes Technology Council. And for us, our, our um, goal really is to be able to um, share the lessons of, of how our software, but also our, our techniques and our, our thinking um, can help companies stay safe. Um, you know, not to get too far into the weeds of around cybersecurity, but there's this, uh, there's this concept, it's not a standard, it's really just a way of thinking uh, called zero trust. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of individual companies are grappling with the question of, first, what does zero trust mean? Uh, but then second, how, how can they implement a zero trust? Thinking? And of course, the goal here is, is to be able to ultimately stay more safe relative to how things have been done in the past. Zero trust is a potential solution, but there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of question, there's a lot of um, uncertainty and, and it's not it's not clear to companies how they can actually be successful. And so our, our goal um, at Pluralock in, in the short term is to really help educate customers around how to achieve zero trust within their organization, which again is, is designed to um, help mitigate risk and, and create a more safe uh, work environment. That is quite fascinating. And I know this is definitely here to stay, cybersecurity. And I feel like privacy is um, getting to that point too, kind of the way cybersecurity was about 10 years ago. We definitely need to do things better, right? Because whatever we've been doing doesn't seem to be working very well. We seem to have breaches almost uh, every single day. And like uh, it was uh, early this year, right? Uh, where uh, for the first time really in, in, the, in the US, our infrastructure uh, was uh, affected and, and really people spending up to $10 a gallon at uh, the pump for something that happened on, on cyber. It's, it's, it's just in, imaginable. I mean, it's almost like, uh, was it 19, 2024, 20, like everything that was science fiction or, or theory and today is, is actually happening. And we definitely need uh, to have more companies like yours to try to uh, innovate and find, uh, I guess, some better uh, best practices because the best practices we have today definitely not working very, very well. Now, is there in, anything you would tell to your uh, 20 something uh, years old? Uh, a lot of people who are listening to us now just uh, got out of college and kind of starting their career. Eventually, they would like to be where, where you are, be a successful founder, C CEO, C-level, IT executive or something. But uh, they just have no idea uh, what is uh, coming down the, uh, the impact. Any, any ad advice you would have for a 20 something? Uh, you're all just ab ab about life, success, and the career in IT. I think that it's it's easy to get trapped in the uh, trapped inside your own head. So it's it's easy to spend all your time researching, reading, learning, um, and I think what you actually need to do is start doing. Uh, right. So my my advice is always to to find something practical, regardless of how big or small. Um, if if we're talking about how how to uh, have an successful a successful career in in IT. Uh, I I would start by buying a Raspberry Pi and start to to build some things. Um, if if you're talking about going more into networking, maybe buy ten Raspberry Pis and and maybe start to to connect them together. If you're if you're interested in um, you know information of things or Internet of Things, IoT and and so on. Um, you know, again, how can you how can you go build a small weather station? You know, like actually get your hands dirty and and start doing. What that's going to do is twofold. It's going to uh, actually give you experience, uh, which is crucial and and hard to hard to get just by reading a book. But the second thing is is you're going to realize um, what is enjoyable, what gives you satisfaction. And I think that you only get as a reaction to something else. Um, and so I think if you if you can start just that doing process, you're very quickly going to get the the, the feedback necessary to calibrate and say, oh, well, I like doing this. I don't like doing this. Okay, well, let's go focus over there. And then you can start layering on the thing where you add people to it. So go ask for help. Go have work on a project and then go ask for help with, with somebody else. And then, um, you know, those those types of, of interactions have a, have a habit of snowballing. Um, this is how most of open source, uh, you know, technology is, is actually released in the world where you scratch your own itch and suddenly it, it turns into a project 
uh, unto itself. And so I think if you can start down that journey, um, you'll you'll find the rest of the answers along the way. But you have to start. That is uh, quite uh, fascinating. Now it's uh, the time of the podcast where I go into my seven favorite question. Uh, number one being, what is the greatest lesson you have learned so far? Well, I think that I had I had trouble choosing the answer to this because there's there's a number. Um, I, as I mentioned earlier, I spent about four and a half years uh, solving problems with data, specifically in e-commerce. And the single biggest takeaway from that time was successful retailers made their money on the buy. They purchased products to sell in a way that almost guaranteed them that they were going to be successful. They didn't need to worry about finding an untapped market. They didn't need to uh, do anything super complex. As long as you bought the merchandise appropriately that you then wanted to sell, whether online or, or in, in physical retail, you had a pretty good likelihood of being successful. And so I think there's, there's a corollary to that in, in a whole lot of other industries as well. I mean, think of real estate. If you can make money when you buy a house or buy a piece of land, even if you don't totally nail that renovation that you then want to do to, 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 to sell the, the house after the fact, if you can make money on the buy, that is a huge component of success. That is so very uh, important. I think it was Frank Cobb who said, right, um, begin with the end uh, in uh, mind. And uh, yeah, that's, that's definitely the way to be successful. So what is the uh, secret of your success, you think? Uh, I don't think that there is one. I wish that there was. I, I think it's been, it's been a combination of, of hard work, luck, um, asking for help. So I, I certainly would not be here uh, without a lot of very generous people along the way. I think that the, the, the term is standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, and so I think that, that it's the combination of those things that ultimately get you to where you are. And you really, you only know if you're where you want to be if you look behind you and, and sort of chart your path. I don't think there is a silver bullet. You just got to go in and do it. That is wonderful. I think somebody else said, uh, you know, you are not an island and we really need one another to be uh, successful. Uh, which leads me to the second question. Uh, what are you learning now since leaders are always learning? Uh, well, for us, Pluralock, we, we went public just over a year ago. And so everything that I knew about uh, finances in a private company don't apply quite in the same way. Uh, and so for, for me personally, it's, it's really about learning the capital markets and learning the, the differences and the nuances, but also the similarities. Um, I've actually been surprised by some of the things that I had a, a preconceived notion about being very different once you're public versus being private uh, and actually found that that wasn't the case. So it's been, it's been a very interesting learning um, environment and one that I expect will, will continue to, uh, to challenge me and to challenge us in the, in, in the future. Wow. And also for people who, who may be looking at you now, right? C CEO, founder, going public successfully, member of the uh, Pop Technology Council, they feel like your life has been nothing but success after success after success after success. <laughs> so the third question I have for you is, how has failure shaped your life? Uh, so, so many ways. I think one of the big things, I, I had a, a health issue that, that prevented me from completing most of high school and never really did much post-secondary after that. Um, and that, um, I, I always felt, um, I always felt that I didn't quite measure up against the people who went and got their BAs and then MBAs or, or even PhDs. Uh, and so the lack of that academic uh, accreditation, um, I felt was something that kept me back. What it did do actually is it actually has made me work harder to try and make up for that thing that I, that I felt that I was missing. Um, and so, I, so I, in a way, I've actually tried to turn that negative into a positive. Um, that's probably the, the single largest, largest thing. Thank, thank you for saying that. Now, uh, I know in, in schools around uh, countries really around the world, they, they kind of like for people to go to college, maybe get a master's degree or even a PhD and so forth. But when I think about this, yeah, I mean, I guess if you have an education, no, it is, it is, it is great. I have nothing against it, but I've always thought that people who are extremely successful, almost all of them dropped out of college. 
and they ended up you know, making billions and being the richest people uh, in uh, uh, the world where people who go to college end up with a huge uh, student loan and, and uh, then uh, kind of live uh, average life. So uh, I, I guess my, my, my question to you, like even recently uh, in Silicon Valley specifically, companies like Apple, Facebook, they no longer uh, require a bachelor degree like to be a coder or, or any anything like that, which, which kind of makes sense, right? Because experience, uh, you being able to solve a problem is much more important than just a piece of paper with your name. How, how do you do you feel about uh, uh, education when it comes into the workforce, especially in uh, IT and cyber uh, security? Well, I, the way that the way that I view education in, in a hiring context is that it, it, it in theory should be a proxy for ability. And so the closer the education is to the job that you're going to perform, in theory, the greater the likelihood that that should translate into actual ability. So with that, um, with that uh, sort of mental model, we favor practical um, programs. Uh, like if you go to uh, trade school, for instance, and you, and you get, uh, you know, if you do a two year program in, in coding, um, but it's much more oriented around the, the practical elements of that. Um, that may be more beneficial than, um, you know, a, a bachelor's degree of, of some sort of STEM, you know, math, physics, et cetera, because it's more directly relevant to hiring a developer or, hire, you know, hiring somebody like that. So, so as a proxy, it can be helpful if there is something that's out there that matches the job that this, the person is actually going to do. But that's really only a part of the conversation and a part of the interview process where, Look, you have it. You may not have it. Um, in fact, we've we've had a number of of folks uh, who have been very successful who didn't have those credentials, uh, but had done projects on their own that were as good, if not better, because they were more directly relevant to to the areas of the business that they were going to actually be working on. So that was super helpful. At the same time, um, you know, we have a number of people who either have PhDs or are, are PhD candidates. So it's not to say that that there's something that's either better or worse. But it really is how does that pertain to the role that we're hiring for and how how strong is that link between the thing that they have done in the past whether that's a phd program or or a self a self-directed um you know project that they've just done on their own how does that tie into the role that they're they're going into that is that is great and uh question number four is uh, who do you know that we should know uh, who are your mentors or thought leaders you are following we should know about? I think one of the, the smartest people uh, that I follow online when it comes to uh, Web3, so so the technology <laughs> formerly known as blockchain uh, and crypto, um, but also clean tech would be Boris Wirtz at Version 1 Ventures, just brilliant uh, venture capitalist um, who's, who's very deep in both of those two sectors. And um, I, I, I continue to learn uh, from him, uh, from a distance, uh, just around um, uh, ar ar around those two. So I, I tend to, to try and consume everything that, that Boris puts out. That is fantastic. So somebody I'm going to be adding to my list to uh, follow. And uh, question uh, number five, uh, what have you read that uh, we should read? What is the best book you've read recently? I think that there's two. I, I just recently finished reading Stand on Guard, uh, which was, um, it's pretty niche. It, it, it speaks to the national security environment in Canada um, and, and specifically the, the, uh, the intelligence community as well as kind of just the, the more broader national security um, community. Um, I find that interesting because there's not as much public domain information as compared to the United States or, or other um, you know, large powers. So, so that was quite interesting, but uh, again, pretty, pretty specific to, uh, to a Canadian operating in the cybersecurity industry. Um, the second would be a book called The Kill Chain by Christian Bros. Just a fantastic read around the future of warfare, how drones, robotics, AI, um, and some of the emerging technologies are going to, and, and frankly, I think already have shaped um, both current and, uh, and upcoming potential conflicts. Um, so very, very interesting, um, very, very interesting read and, and one that I've been recommending to a lot of people. Thanks. And uh, Stand on Guard, who is the author for that one? Uh, I don't Do actually have it, Andy. 
Okay, I have to... we can, I can I can I can get it from you later. I, I believe it's probably Eve's Anglo. I'd stand on guard for whom? A people's history of the Canadian military. Is is that your one? Uh, I I actually think it's just stand on guard. Okay, okay, that, that's done. I definitely got the uh, uh, second one, the uh, Kill Chen, defending America and the future of high tech warfare by Christian right. Bros. And we we're gonna make sure to add links to to those later on. Thank you. Uh, so much because I know uh, leaders are always readers, right? And uh, so question number six is what have you done that we should do? Uh, what is one action you've taken that has positively impacted your life, you think? Well, I, th I think I'm a late adopter on this one, but I, I recently took up TM meditation, uh, you know, probably 10 years after everybody else started, uh, but I found it to be super helpful uh, in terms of replenishing energy throughout the day. Wow. That is uh, very nice and nice, especially now after, you know, we've been going through this global uh, pandemic. I know a lot of people are putting uh, their pros perspective back in uh, uh, check, right? It's not always about money and all of that. There are things that are probably much more important and taking time for yourself too and mental, mental health and meditating and thinking is definitely very valuable. Uh, earlier today, I was uh, in interviewing a, a medical doctor who actually wrote a, a book uh, throughout this ex experience, just helping people live better uh, emotional life. So the very, very uh, last question I have for you is how can we add value to you? Uh, I, I think that the, the number one thing that I would ask is uh, to advance the conversation when it comes to cybersecurity. I think one of the misconceptions uh, amongst business leaders who are non-technical is that security only matters to a bank or, to, or matters to uh, kind of the obvious industries, healthcare, et cetera. Um, but it, it, it's, just, it's just so important. It, I think that the, the way that I would describe it is to say, um, if you have a storefront, you probably need an alarm system. And if you have a digital presence, which frankly everybody does, because everybody has email, everybody has websites, et cetera, you need also something equivalent to that alarm system. Now, unfortunately, it's a lot more complex. You can't just buy something off the shelf and hope it works, but it, it, it's, a, it's an issue that does impact you. You know, one of the things um, just being in the, in the junior Canadian public markets um, is that there's a lot of mining companies, there's a lot of uh, mineral oil and gas companies, and there's not as much of an awareness that, that there are threats out there that are targeting those companies okay. specifically. Uh, or, you know, trying to get competitive M&A intelligence or competitive um, bid intelligence so that other other companies can win bids just by knowing what your pricing is. So it's a, it's a very large problem. And so what I would ask your audience is to just help advance the conversation uh, when it comes to, to cybersecurity. And if we can be a resource uh, and help with that conversation, we'd be delighted to do so. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ian, with your time. You've been very, very uh, generous. And I think... Uh our audience here would be very, very grateful that you took the time, gave us a lot of insight to help us be a better leader, but also achieve greater levels of success. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Leadership and Success Podcast with your host, Coach BZ. If you like what you heard, please subscribe to our channels and come back for more wisdom nuggets on how you may develop into a better leader and achieve greater levels of success. Leadership is the most critical skill. The world will always need leaders to lead others, deploy the next disruptive technology, or execute a business strategy. You may as well decide on counting yourself among the 21st century leaders. See you right here next time on the Leadership and Success Podcast with Coach BZ.